Hello, I'm Brad Fitzpatrick, and this is a talk about Go at Tailscale. Uh, first off, I want to say uh, hello again. Um, long time no see. I haven't uh, been to a conference since uh, FOSDEM 2015, and that was actually the trip that I met my wife. And so we have been busy raising two boys, <laughs> and they're kind of like the number one reason that I don't get to go to many conferences lately. I guess number two being the pandemic. So anyway, doing it from home, and um, whatever. So uh, for anyone who hasn't met me, hello for the first time. It's a pity that we can't uh, get a beer after that. This is me, I guess, in uh, 2015 or maybe 2014 at FOSDEM. I still kind of look like that, except for now I'm giving myself my own uh, pandemic haircuts, and it's just easier to cut it all off. So, A um, bit of a background about me. I um, did LiveJournal back in the day, which was kind of one of the first uh, social networking, blogging, forum, commenting sites. And... Uh, it had a bunch of infrastructure, and LiveJournal was open source, and Memcached was uh, written for LiveJournal was open source, and things like OpenID, and uh, had a lo load balancer, a couple load balancers that we wrote for it, and um, a distributed file system. So it got me into the whole open source world. And uh, uh, one of my friends that I was doing the startup with was uh, Evan, and I'm going to call him my wise friend Evan. And he was always saying wise things like, you know, telling me that I should try Debian and, you know, telling me that he re-implemented Git and OCaml and Haskell and he had opinions about the storage format and opinions between all the various languages. And, you know, telling me like back in 2006 or 2007-ish that like Rust looked interesting. And uh, one day he up and quits uh, Linux and he kind of says, like, I'm, I'm only using Windows now. And he wouldn't tell me why and he couldn't say anything. Um... So I was really curious, but I suspected that it had something to do with him being at Google. And um, of course, he couldn't really say anything. So I joined Google. I wanted to see what all my friends there were doing that were so secretive. And it turns out he was working on Chrome. Uh, and he had to work on Chrome for Windows until he could do Chrome for Linux, which is what he really wanted to do. So uh, I joined, and he was like, sends me an email, and he says, hey, welcome to Google. Uh, it's kind of like, you know... Startup is kind of kind of like driving a jet ski, but now that you're Google, it's kind of like more like driving a giant cargo ship. You know, you got to like spin the wheel for 15 minutes and nothing happens. But, you know, once the ship does start moving in the right direction, oh, that momentum, those resources. Um, so I got sucked into the Google machine and I um, I worked on some social stuff for a while. I worked on the Gmail's back end, um, the contacts back end. I worked on Android for a bit. Um but then I really fell in love with Go, and I kind of just got sucked into Go, and I did that for 10 years working on this inner library and the, the HTTP in particular and um, the, our build system, our build and test system. Uh, worked on, like, releases and kind of all over the place. I guess some dev rally things occasionally. Um, but after 10 years, it was kind of time for a change. 12 and a half years at Google was enough. 10 years um, is kind of my limit doing one thing. So I joined Tailscale. Uh, Tailscale is a startup. Um, it is. Uh, I was joining right as I turned 40, so people on uh, Hacker News were speculating that uh, I joined because this was my midlife crisis and this was my uh, sports car. So yeah, I guess this is my this is my sports car jet ski and doing a startup again. But I like startups. Um, it's fun. So what is Tailscale? Um, Tailscale, I guess you can say, is a new style VPN. It's not like the VPN that. Um, we don't run any exit nodes, so you, it's not like the type of uh, consumer VPN where you're trying to hide your IP address so you can download something from another company, from another country. It's it's so companies or individuals can have a network of devices that can all talk to each other. So it it gives you the illusion that you have one flat network where all of the uh, devices can talk to each other and see each other, um, subject to um, central ACL policies that you can set. But it's uh, WireGuard based, and we do all the NAT and uh, firewall traversal automatically, so you don't have to like configure your network, and you don't have to like open up firewall ports or anything like that. It uh, just magically always works. Logically, it gives you like a a network card that has a, a static IP address that's uh, just for you and for your device, and um, any traffic you want to do over that IP address uh, just works. And so the um, the uh, open source parts are like the uh, Everything that you run on your machine is open source, except for like the GUIs on uh, proprietary operating systems. So, the Android app is fully open source, but like the iOS app uh, is not. So, anyway, that's kind of our policy now. That if it's uh, it, it's open source, if your operating system is open source, uh, it's also free for individuals. Um, we want to like ideally we want to only make money from companies, and so far we're doing fine making money from companies. So. 
we don't have to charge individuals who just want to use it with friends and family or to like learn, you know, have fun with networking or whatever. So I said uh, we run on basically any OS as our goal. We run um, our primary operating systems are Linux, Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. Um, we also run on things like you know FreeBSD, which um, is underneath things like PFSense or OPNSense. And we run on uh, Synology, which is you know Linux, but um, Linux on a number of architectures and kind of a, a unusual user space for Linux. Likewise, uh, edge routers are a number of uh, op architectures. Um, but also a unique user space. So that kind of uh, seems like a disaster, right? Supporting all these things because um, we're, uh, we're a small team of people on jet skis and so we don't have like time to have a team of people working for uh, on a client for every operating system. So you might say, if only there was some magical way to write cross-platform native applications. And uh, the, it seems like nowadays the, uh, the industry answer is, well, just use Electron, right? You know, just... Just take this web browser with all the security restrictions removed and uh, you can write everything in JavaScript. And I mean, I guess, like, maybe that would work. It, would, it, it seems painful, but I'm not like a JavaScript person. So um, that is not the route we run. Um, <laughs> it doesn't seem fun for me, but um, maybe it would work. No, we use Go because we're, uh, we're a bunch of Go people and um, we use Go for everything. So this talk is uh, first about <laughs> how you can use Go for everything, and uh, you shouldn't be too scared about that. So on Linux, of course, um, Go runs, and that's not really surprising at all. Um, it kind of works in the way you would expect. There's a, a, a daemon that runs, and that thing runs as root or root-ish with a bunch of capabilities, and uh, you can run it under systemd or whatever your uh, init process manager of choices. And then there's a CLI that talks to the daemon to do things like uh, reconfigure the network and whatever. Um, you can just go install that stuff. That's all open source. It uh, uses DevNet ton to get packets in and out of the kernel. And um, on like Linux, it uses Netlink to subscribe to network change events. Things like you know, if you're uh, if you changed Wi-Fi or you're plugged to Ethernet in or out or things like that. And then on on FreeBSD, there's like DevD to like get equivalent change notifications. A uh, ton is an interface that's uh, available on most operating systems that you let you inject. IP packets in and out of the kernel. So you can do, uh, you could, in user space, you can implement a network device. And so TailScale is all in user space currently. There are other, um, because you have to do a system call for every packet that goes in or out of the kernel, um, DevNet ton has just been getting slower and slower after all the Spectre mitigations and whatnot. So we'll, we'll probably be looking into other interfaces on some operating systems, at least on Linux. Um, but for now, we're just using ton, which is good enough. Uh, on Windows, uh, we have a little GUI. This is the not open source part. Um, but otherwise, all the open source bits work on Windows. So if you want to use the uh, TailScale D uh, daemon or the TailScale CLI, we actually include uh, both of these in our uh, our Windows download. So the only part of the Windows download that is not open source is the little system tray icon. Uh, for that, we use uh, the LXN walk package. Um, that is... Um, GitHub Alexa Walk it stands for like Windows Application Level Toolkit, I think, or something like that. Um, but it lets you make, you know, system tray icons and windows. And so we, we use a very small subset of it. Just we make the system tray icon and we add some menu items and we disable them and disable them and check them and um, you have sub menus. And, but anyway, you just specify some callbacks for things and you set them checked and unchecked. So it's it's a pretty Go-ish API on top of the Win32 stuff, which is very much not Go-ish. Uh, for macOS, um, there are two options. You could either use the open source stuff again, either um, just running the, the daemon and the client, or we also have a GUI that's in the Apple App Store. And the GUI part is um, looks like that. It, uh, you know, basically similar to the Windows thing. There's a, a menu bar application that tells you whether you're connected or not, lets you like log in, log out, change accounts or whatever. Um, it's written in Swift, unfortunately. Um, it'd be nice to be pure Go, but we have to be a little pragmatic. So that part is written in Swift, but we call into Go uh, from Swift. So we have very, very, again, limited code written in there. Um, the trick from Go is you use a build mode C archive. And so Xcode then, or you know, your, your Xcode Swift project thinks that it's calling into a C function. So you write, um, you write like a little foo.h file that 
declares some extern symbols. Like for instance, uh, we wanna, we link in the whole CLI into the main application. So we don't have to ship a second application because on uh, in the app store, you're not allowed to exec another process. So we can't ship a second binary and have you exec that. So we link the CLI into the application. So if you run the tailscale.app binary itself with arguments, it just acts like the open source CLI. So to invoke that, we have um, we pass in the directory that uh, is the the application directory on disk. And for in, in Swift, at the very beginning, basically an equivalent of func main, and this application did finish launching. We um, basically call go b cli, and then in the uh, the go part, you just import c, and uh, you export some symbol. This is like a magic uh, c go comment here that puts that symbol in the uh, whatever the symbol table of the c archive part, and then whatever. Then this code takes over and runs. So um, in the future, I just saw that uh, there's this uh, Mac driver program that. Uh, gives you all like these Mac OS APIs and integration uh, purely from Go. And uh, they have like GUI stuff working and stuff. So this could be a future interesting direction to, um, to you know, at least try out to write Mac OS applications purely in Go without the Swift part, but we'll see. Uh, on iOS, we basically use like 98% of the same code or more of uh, as Mac OS. It's basically identical. Um, this one is not open source because iOS is an open source, so I don't know. And it's also really freaking impossible to, um, because we use these network extensions uh, on iOS, you have to have like special entitlements, Apple calls it. So you can't even, even if we made the iOS client open source, you couldn't just, you couldn't just compile it and run the damn thing because you have to be using an Apple account that's in an organization that has permission to use the network extension APIs or something. So um, it would almost be too painful to open source it, just supporting people and trying to answer questions about how you build the thing. But um, but so far, we're just sticking with our philosophy that um, we're open source on platforms that are open source. But uh, the Android client, though, is open source. Um, you can get it at Tailscale. Okay, Android, it's also in the F-Droid store, and it's uh, in the Google Play store. It's written using a Geo, um, which is uh, written primarily by Elias uh, Nauer, and so he writ wrote our uh, Tailscale Android client. And so it uses Geo for all like the, the GUI stuff, and a limited amount of Java. There, there's not a bunch. There's a, I didn't count the lines, but it's mostly JNIs into Go using basically the same trick. There's um, a JNI package that exports um, some various JNI things, and there's some JNI wrappers around all the, the typical uh, C to Java bridge API. And then the, the app itself is pretty small. There's like a GUI backend thread that runs or Go routine that runs, and then there's a, the backend part that handles packets that runs. Um, this is kind of what it looks like to uh, call JNI stuff. You declare, um, you put the native keyword on certain uh, functions in Java, and then it calls into, then you export the thing uh, using, again, the same Seago trick, and then then you're in the JNI world. So it's, you know, it's ugly, but it limits how much Java we had to write. All the packet processing, again, is the exact same code base in Go. On all the uh, random NASs and hardware, you know, the, the Synologies and QNAPs and OPN sense, um, basically all of those, we just take the open source code and we, um, we use go goose FreeBSD or goose Linux and Gorch or whatever. There's, um, we're not doing most of these builds right now. We probably will start, but there's some community projects to do like Synology and QNAP that are just little wrappers around, um, the open source code doing things like this. Uh, on the server side, we're all go We're you know, basically we have a coordination server that deals with, um, notifying other devices in your network when something changed so like you know someone's uh endpoints change or like they um i don't know yeah the administrator changed the ACL policy or something so something some configuration about your network changed and we have to tell the other devices so we have all the clients are like stuck in a long pole so a long hanging http request and that's that part is all go uh, our database is also Go. It's just we just migrated to etcd maybe six months ago or so. 
and Tailscale's uh, web administration panel. I would love to tell you it's Go, but uh, it's TypeScript, um, which I guess is fine. Um, the tooling is not very fine. Um, I'm kind of horrified by the JavaScript tooling coming from Go, but um, I don't know. I'm biased. But my friend Evan, the wise old Evan, he uh, he loves TypeScript, and he actually works on the TypeScript team at Google nowadays. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm willing to keep an open mind and try it out, but I haven't got into it too much. In the future, it would be nice to maybe move to um, ES Build at least, um, which is written in Go, and it's um, kind of a TypeScript, or it's like JavaScript and TypeScript and everything, that world, front-end tooling replacement. I don't really understand any of this stuff, but... The numbers on it look good. All right, so the, uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about was how we added NAT traversal to WireGuard. Um, WireGuard by itself doesn't deal with any like firewalls or NAT traversal things. It kind of assumes that the internet is wide open and connectable, which is a nice dream, and we want to help make that dream possible. So uh, we have a blog post about all the tricks you can do to get through NAT so you can have two peers that can actually connect to each other. And this is applicable for, you know, all software that needs to connect peer to peer, whether that's, you know, WebRTC or whatnot. But um, we have a bunch of pretty pictures that kind of explains the theory behind it. Um, first, I want to show the uh, WireGuard uh, Go code base that we use. Um, Tailscale is just written on top of WireGuard, and we use their uh, Go implementation. And their Go implementation has um, a number of interfaces. One of them is con.bind. Um, I omitted some of the methods, but the interesting ones here are there's methods to receive a packet over either IPv4 or IPv6. This is an encrypted packet, and you return uh, the number of bytes you read and the endpoint, which is basically uh, a map. It's another interface, but you basically map from the address you got it from or like however you know what, what user or what peer this is associated with. Uh, and then there's another method to send a plain text packet to that endpoint, and then WireGuard does its encryption and sends it out to the endpoint, whatever the uh, the addresses of that endpoint are. And then there's, you know, click close. So we have this uh, package called MagicSock, which implements this interface. So we have a whole bunch of stuff, but notably like those things you just saw, receiving uh, IPv4, v 6 or send. Um, and so what this package is trying to do is always finding the best path to these endpoints. and so we want to work in all environments, including environments where like UDP is blocked, whether that's some crappy hotel or airport that you know blocks UDP or some corporate environment or whatever. So in that case, we'll fall back to, we offer a uh, TCP relay and we have a whole bunch of like globally distributed uh, servers, a bunch of like cheapo, cheapo VMs, uh, you know, like five bucks a month, but we just have a ton of them. And your client picks the nearest one. And that's this set dirt map. When Tailscale first connects, we give it a, a data structure that has all of our um, all of our like kind of edge nodes, and these derp services are is basically an encrypted packet relay where you in the IP header instead of the address you want to talk to, what IP port you want to talk to, instead the IP header is like effectively the public key you want to send the encrypted packet to, and so we don't know what we're sending, right? It's a big encrypted WireGuard blob, uh, but we route these around for you. So if you don't have direct connectivity yet. Uh, then we'll route your uh, your WireGuard packets. Um, but then what the Magic Sock packet does is once it does all these NAT traversal tricks and figures out and punches holes in like the NAT state machines and and the connection tracking tables, then the clients transition within like a second to uh, direct connections and they stop using uh, the derp relays. Uh, last thing I want to talk about was um, the net IP type. So this is the standard library type to represent an IP address. The representation is a, uh, a slice of bytes. The problem with this is it's mutable because it's a slice of bytes and that's part of the contract that um, if you have one of these or you give it to somebody, you don't know that they're not going to mess with it. So, you know, you have to do defensive copies. That's always kind of what ends up happening when you have mutable public things. Um, it's also transparent. It's not an opaque type. The underlying type is a byte slice and that's part of its uh, the Go One contract. So. It's not like we can fix that in Go, um, as opposed to things like time.time, .time, which was just an opaque struct. So when uh, Go 1.9 needed monotonic time support, we just changed the representation of time, and it just worked out. And nobody like knew that we changed the representation of times. Um, but because the net IP type is a you know the underlying type is a byte slice, you can't do anything with it. It's also not uh, comparable. It's not comparable because um, it's a byte, it's a slice, and in Go you can't use a slice as a map key, and it doesn't support equal equal. 
It's also like really big, you know, an IPv6 address is only 16 bytes, an IPv4 address is only four bytes, but to store one of these in Go, you need a 24 byte slice header, and that doesn't actually store any of the address bytes. You still need then, you know, the, the slice has to point to an underlying array that's either four or 16 bytes, and in Go, by default, parse IP always returns 16 bytes. So you end up with 40 bytes to store a four byte IPv4 address. So it's a little wasteful. And uh, there's actually two IP address types in the standard library. There's a uh, there's the one that can store IPv6 zones and the ones that can't. So some of the APIs return one, some return the other, some take one, some take the other. So it's kind of weird that there are two. Uh, also, the in the standard library, it's you know arguably a feature, but also a bug that it kind of um, it does the IPv6 mapped IPv4 address uh, mapping for you automatically. So if you got some, if you got two strings from the network, one user told you you know, I am 1.2.3.4, and the other one said my IP address is colon colon FFFF, you can't tell them apart because they have the exact same representation in memory. Um, you know, again, it's kind of a feature, but it's it's kind of a bummer that uh, that information gets lost. So we made our own IP address type. I'd kind of been stewing on this for a while. Um, it's inet.af netadder.ip. Uh, the AF, of course, stands for address family. Um, to uh, kind of jump to the end of the story, the end, the representation ended up looking like this. We've changed it like four or five times, but I think I think this is the final answer. We'll see. Um, so we have we made a uint 128 type, which just has two uint 64s, a high and a low, and that's in that adder is where we store the v6 address or the or the four bytes of the uh, IPv4 address. And then we have this thing that I'll explain more in a bit, but that encodes both the IPv6 zone and the address family in one, depending on what pointer value you put in there. Uh, so the advantage of this representation is it's immutable. So you can pass these around like a time dot time and um, you know nobody can mess with them. It's opaque, so we can change the representation for a sixth time if uh, we find a better way to represent IP addresses. It's only 24 bytes, so it's much. It's the same size as a slice header in Go. So it's the same size as a net.ip, um, just the header part itself, and we don't have to store the data. So it's one. It's a value type. There's no allocations. I, I guess I should have listed that too. That as opposed to the standard library that allocates, this type doesn't allocate at all. We also can store the difference between uh, v4 and v6, and it does v6 zones, so we don't need two different types, one like IP and one like IP adder. So to do that um, magic, you know, uh, fam or zone field there, we made this other package called intern, which is uh, an unsafe package, and it's kind of gross, but um, we've tested it and audited it and tested, you know, talked with other people about it. So I, we think it's correct now. Um, the API is um, very simple, but very odd. We have this value type. This is the whole API on the screen. I just kind of had to shove it in here to fit. There's this opaque value type that used the pointer of it because we need finalizers. So we need the pointer of this value and we, we'd have some stuff in there. But the idea is you want to get a globally unique, for the global unique within the scope of your process, a globally unique pointer to a value that is one-to-one -one with some comparable value. So the, the contract we say here is if you get V and get V2, the returned value is equal if and only if the return pointer will be the same for get one of v2 if and only if you know, the two arguments you passed in are equal. So if you call get a foo at one point of your program and later you saw say get a foo, the returned value will be the exact same pointer. So the naive implementation of this, and then then you can get back that original thing you passed in, whatever this uh, comp value passed in, you can get it back out by saying get. So the naive implementation of this is you would just put it in a map keyed by an empty interface, and uh, it would just grow infinitely. But we don't want to leak memory infinitely, especially if you're like parsing IPv IP addresses from the network that have a zone or whatever, and it just grows and grows and grows. So we want to do some cleanup. So the trick is we have a package level mutex that guards a map, and the map is keyed by effectively an empty interface, and it points to the uint pointer of the value. So we're hiding the pointer from the garbage collector to let the garbage collector collect those values anyway. And so this one basically doesn't contribute to the, you know, effectively the reference count of the thing. So then internally, when we get these, we have to use this go no check pointer allocate, this <laughs> compiler directive, because go would otherwise tell us that 
we're you know we're doing it wrong and this code is not safe and so we have to declare yes yes we we know that we're violating all the rules and this is terrible um and so the implementation we have we have a safe implementation too just for um uh checking ourselves but in practice what it ends up doing is doing a, a lookup on the map and if it, we find it in the map then we take it from the uint pointer to an unsafe pointer and then get to the value and then we mark the resurrected flag which we have on our value and then we return it. So I'll explain resurrected in a second. But basically that says it was potentially dead. This thing could have been the last known reference and it could have just like, it could have been in the process of dying and being collected by the garbage collector. And we just brought it back to life through this uint uh, pointer. Otherwise we make a new value. So this makes a new value pointer with, you know, resurrected false and whatever. And uh, then we set the finalizer on it and we put it in the map, but we don't put the value pointer itself in the map, we put the uint pointer of it in the map. So then the finalizer, which we had registered with runtime set finalizer, uh, we grab the mutex again, the exact same mutex that was used to get the thing. And if the value that we're uh, finalizing was resurrected, that means we lost the race. Somebody else brought this back to life right as the garbage collector was trying to kill it. So we turn resurrected false on and we reinstall the finalizer that the runtime had just removed for us before it called our finalizer. You can only have one finalizer on an object, and when the Go runtime calls your finalizer, it's saying that that thing is really dead, but you have one last chance to bring it back to life. Uh, and so this is us bringing it back to life. Uh, if it wasn't resurrected, then we just delete it from the map, and then our, our map actually shrinks back down to zero. So then what we do is we have this intern value. So this pointer is guaranteed to be globally unique within the process. So we also want to encode the, um, the address family in there. So we have some sentinel values and we use the nil. So we want the zero value to be bogus. So we make Z zero basically means that's a zero value for an IP, it's uninitialized. Uh, Z four is a sentinel value that means it's a IPv4 address. Uh, Z six no zone is a sentinel that means it's a, it's a V six address, but it doesn't have a, uh, a scope or a, a zone. And then our accessors to add a zone to an IP, we have this method with zone. And if it's not a v6 address to begin with, it doesn't make sense to have a zone, so we just return the IP unchanged, so whether it's the zero value or v4. Uh, if we're trying to clear the zone, we just set it to that sentinel that we had before, that uh, z6 no zone. And if uh, it's some non-empty string, we call our package the intern get by string, and this returns a globally unique uh, within the process pointer that we assign to get z. And it's that pointer has a reference to the zone that we passed in. So then we want to get the zone back out. Again, if it's a zero value, so if z is nil, we just return, I guess this, this should say z zero instead of nil, but whatever, uh, it returns empty string. Otherwise we call get on the thing, and this could return, um, it could return a nil interface, but that's why we do this comma okay, and we say, we want a string out of it if it's a string. If it's not a string, I don't care. Give me the zero value of a string. And then we return the zone. So anyway, that was fun. So we're using this IP address type more and more for all of our stuff and kind of pushing it down to all our dependencies. And it kind of makes life a lot easier. And it has a whole bunch of stuff. It does um, IP sets and ranges and sitter math and lets us cut up sitters in various different ways and find all the ranges within them or take a range and find all the overlapping sitters to fill that space. And so it lets us do a whole lot of network math. Um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. And if you haven't tried Tailscale, try it out. It's uh, pretty fun and pretty empowering, and uh, I, I think it's nice. Thanks.